Hi. <laughs> oh, I, oh, the jams are still going. I should probably turn off the jams. <laughs> <laughs> what? What are you talking about? <laughs> I like having a soundtrack. It's pretty great. Yeah, I mean, you know, we can leave the jams going, but I, I don't I don't think we need them. Oh, man. Fair. Oh. <laughs> I mean, Indeed. I, I feel as though I was told by the boss to, to pump up the jams. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, welcome to another heaping uh, help heap, heaping. I always forget what right. it is. Heaping, Another hot heaping helping. Hot heaping, heaping helping <laughs> of owl bear soup. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we we had to take last week off due to uh, technical issues. Um, hopefully we'll be able to make it through today without any technical issues, but uh, yeah. everything should be solved by tomorrow for sure. Uh, but here we are. We're we're ready to go. Uh, I am we one are. of your one of your 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 talking heads today. My name is uh, Justin. <laughs> and I am rich uh, talking head number two. I like it. I like it. <laughs> and that's and that's and that's going to be the theme for today. We're going to be it's we're just going to be a couple of talking heads. We got a lot to talk about. Oh, uh, my gosh. We have it's wow. oh man. Yeah, I mean, just to kick it off, just to kick it off. We have Dune, right? We have Dune I to mean, talk about. Right. right. Yep. Yes. And then there's D&D &D, <sighs> and then there's yeah. news and then there's and then there's news. And we have a couple of reviews. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's gonna be it's gonna be a, a pretty a pretty informative episode. These have been two big weeks for role playing, so yeah. I'm pretty excited. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Let's let's get into it, right? Let's talk about what kind of gaming we did over this Ooh. past couple of weeks. Uh, and yeah. I think I think the biggest thing standing out to me clearly is uh destiny 2 no i mean dune exactly dune dune <laughs> we've been we have been having so much fun playing this dune rpg with this uh you know this motley crew that has been put together by uh a bene Gesserit and uh and somehow somehow we haven't killed ourselves yet it's pretty impressive i yeah. mean i feel like almost immediately you tried really really hard <laughs> i mean almost purposely um, right Right? Almost <laughs> like we're going to see what disaster befalls the House of Posh here. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, well, it's good to hear that you, you're saying you're having fun because I always, whenever I, I am DMing, I'm always like, that's my thing. So thank you for the verification. Um, <laughs> you have been verified. I, I, I love this game so much. I think it's been a lot of fun. Um, last time we started meeting our Motley crew through the, the montage, right? And when I, whenever I think about these, I think about like the Oceans movies where it's mm -hmm. just like you get to see someone at their best, best. Um, <laughs> and and this one, began, exactly, the body count started early, right? Our very first one was was Teos, uh, Teos's character, Dr. Ewan, um, going out and, and just fulfilling an assassination, right? Immediately. Just like, yeah, I got to poison this person um, for reasons. Um, <laughs> and my favorite thing was Cohen went next. I think, I think it was yeah. Cohen next. And, uh, and we, we talked about this, I think after the show or maybe during that Teos had escalated things so dramatically immediately that Cohen was like, Oh shoot, I got to kill someone. I got to, <laughs> I got to get in here. <laughs> oh man. And it was just off and running. The next thing was like a huge theft. Um, like just, just uh, mugging someone in an alley after a carefully conceived plot, which was fantastic. And then you, of course, um, I the uh, our ace pilot. On, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> on someone who was upsetting the flow of the family. And mm -hmm. uh, so I drew, drew my ornithopter, which has wings that flap. It's more like a dragonfly right. than a propeller plane or than yeah, a yeah. Uh, telecopter. <laughs> Yep. And, uh, and, and, uh, you know, so, so I purposely picked, I picked my, 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 my two combinations that would bring me to lowest, uh, the lowest right. possible number to hit. Right. Uh, you were it, destined for failure. I was, I was, I was aiming for <laughs> failure with this purposely because I mm -hmm. wanted to, to play with the mechanics. It's, you know, it, it's, 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 it's not only just a, a fun role-playing experience. It's also a learn to play. So, you know, I, right. I, I wanted to test the edges so that, you know, when people look later, they can see like, oh, this is how you test the edges. And this is how you recover from it, which is what happened. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. So, yeah. So, you know, it's like I rolled my dice. Uh, I had the worst chance of any of my dice possibilities. And I still barely succeeded by the skin of my teeth uh, in dropping uh, manure on, on a, not, not necessarily a rival, I think we decided, but more of a, you know, an upstart 
uh, right. who, who yeah. needed who needed a little bit of a, you know, who, who I thought deserved vengeance. <laughs> Right. It, it's like when you're in a typical workplace scenario and someone is getting a little bit out of line. And so you dump like a wheelbarrow full of manure on their head. Right. Well, I mean, I did work. And I'll get them back in line. <laughs> I, I, I did work construction for a, a little while, you know, uh, in, mm -hmm. in the industrial area. Sorry, I spilled my tea. And um, and there's definitely things that people would do to other people who you worked with in porta potties that. Not the best. <laughs> Okay. Right? Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, I believe I believe yes. you can watch one of the Jackass movies to see some of the some of the nonsense you can get up to with a porta potty. Exactly. So so exactly. so this this may be something that I've I've seen before. <laughs> well, it it was funny because it worked, and as you were describing <laughs> it, I was like, oh, this is great because you you are this crack pilot and you're going to be a risk taker, and this all fits. And then I looked at your sheet and saw exactly what you were doing, like picking your worst scores. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, this is going to go badly and it's going to be great. Um, but um, we were able to succeed. And as I recall, you had used one of your focuses in the game, which gives you like, right, you have a short range, but if you hit that range, you get multiple successes. And this is a game all about like generate as many successes as possible. Yeah, yeah. So that was kind, was kind of fun too, because, you know, we were playing a little bit to my strengths, but we were playing, mm -hmm. playing like the weakest edge of my strengths. So that was kind of fun. Right. I, I did enjoy that. I thought that was a ton of fun. Yeah. So I'm looking uh, which forward was, to Tuesday. Yeah, me too. Um, especially because we, we ended and I forgot a thing for your character, which we'll talk about on Tuesday. <laughs> but um, we, we started the adventure and uh, and we are, because what I want to do with the game is, is show off how other people can run it for themselves, right? So we are running the adventure that is in the book, right? It's one of the cores. I've changed it, of course, but mm -hmm. uh, but it's right there so that you can take it and just run it yourself, which is great. Um, but the whole intro scene is all just, just me trying to get you introduced into the setting, um, kind of with your unique character. So all the stuff we've done is, is just me, and I was totally not expecting what happened, which was, of course, perfect for Dune fans. Team went in and was like, House Harkonnen, I know they're not a big deal yet. We're going to make sure they never will be. Let's sabotage them. Let's rip them <laughs> apart. <laughs> it was so yeah. funny. Um, and we and that failed. <laughs> that was our first taste of failure. It went so well, so amazing. And then just the dice went fickle, and on four d twenties got just massive, massive oh. failures. Oh yeah, we um, got four failures on it. Like yeah. it was ridiculous. I, you know, I, I believe it was B who did the roll, and yeah. and and B was like, I, I've never seen dice roll this bad before. No, no, it was so funny. <laughs> and it wasn't. It didn't lead to complications because if you roll bad enough, uh, yeah. the story gets complicated. You get, you know, modifiers, um, which can affect you for the rest of the adventure. None of that happened, which was good, but it was just total, total failure. It was, it was failure. really funny. But it was perfect, <laughs> right? It was, it, it was. I mean, it was absolutely perfect. Like, even, even because, like, we are we were tying a little bit into the Harkonnens, right? You know, mm -hmm. it, it, like, like it could have happened in the movie that this this could have happened. This ragtag yes. group tried to sabotage a couple of the, the ornithopters in the movies and... Uh, it didn't work out for them because no. they are not a great house. They're just an okay right. house. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but the good news is, you know, maybe they'll figure out what's going on. That someone had done something strange, but, but at the moment, you're in the clear. Uh, except, of course, for your house rivals who are uh -huh. down on the planet as well from uh, the house of, or house Dean. Who? Um, the uh, the butter aficionados <laughs> that who? no one can quite remember. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> Wait. Are you uh, sure you're not talking about our, our true rivals, the cult of Yelp? Right, right. <laughs> I mean, haven't seen them. Haven't seen them. No. But uh, uh, I love this group of of assassins that hates you and wants to kill you all. And you're all like, who are you talking about? Who are um, you guys? Yeah. <laughs> it's the silliest game. And I love it. It's so good. Uh, <laughs> it's silly. So, yeah. And yet and yet we are playing. We're, we're like we're playing it. We're playing it straight. Uh, but it's still yeah. silly. And it's it's so yeah. good. It's like a role playing game. It is. <laughs> Everyone I run. <laughs> Very exciting. So yeah, that that's been a lot of fun. We've got two two weeks left. So this coming week and the week after that. Um, so do check it out uh, if you haven't yet. And you can find the uh, you can find them on YouTube if you want to. If you want to check those all out. But uh, Dune RPG is a lot of fun. We've been a lot of fun running it. Uh, Roll Twenty has also put it up on the marketplace so that yes. you can oh use Roll Twenty. And oh my gosh, is it fantastic! <laughs> yeah, I you know it's it, and we're gonna talk about some cool tools a little bit later. But I've been mm -hmm. thinking about my tech stack because this is the way I think about my tech stack for when we go back to being live, when we go back to playing D and D in person. 
uh, uh -huh. what what technology am I going to bring from this experience to the table? I do think yeah. a virtual tabletop is going to be one of those things. Um, it's probably going to be Foundry just because it's all on your PC, right? Uh, sure, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, I may do Foundry it, just for, for, for at-home stuff. Um, but yeah, just the ability to load in adventures, to load in maps, to load in all this info, to load in handouts, right? I mean, that that seems cool. Yeah. Like have have all your party log into your your virtual tabletop and you can give them digital handouts there that they can go check mm -hmm. later. Uh, you can broadcast the maps. Um, you know, when it gets a little bit closer and I start building out all this technology, I'll have to take a lot of pictures and and post them yeah. and, and we'll talk about them more here. But I've definitely <laughs> started like started the process of, all right, what all do I want involved in my next campaign? Right. There was a, an intriguing moment when I was doing um, Fantasy Age for the Exploration Society two years ago, I think. Uh, wow, two years ago? It <laughs> uh, seems that. so long. Um, and, uh, and there was a moment in that where basically I texted everyone an image. Um, and it was basically a player's handout. And Roll20 would just do that for me, just that yeah. instant click. Oh, that felt so good. I was so yeah. happy about it. Like, Here's a picture man. of where you are. And everyone just went, ooh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's it's it really great. good. I, yeah, and, and yeah. you know, and those are the things I think I'm going to take from Virtual Tabletop and and bring into my home game. I Yeah. yeah. Even thinking about ways of wheeling like a, uh, a display out to... Uh, to <laughs> to to you know adventures league events right and setting up the table and you know i mean it would just it would save so much time and yeah technology ftw right right <laughs> we're living in a golden age that's for sure um <laughs> stuff is fun and now that we kind of know how to integrate it like that's even better so good yeah really good wow well uh dune will continue of course but uh what else have you been playing any other games um i in the last two weeks <laughs> in the last two weeks i know right i uh, i messed up the size of your your box so i'm fixing it um <laughs> there you go you got it um Perfect. all right that looks good uh good enough oh that's right that's right i remember now why it looks weird your 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 the font on your name is just a fuzz smaller because your name's longer than mine oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um uh <laughs> I have played, oh, I have played so much of something. So much. I have played so much Magic the Gathering. Oh, really? Let me tell you about this. <laughs> I'm excited. So um, so Adventures uh, for Forgotten Realms has, has recently been released on, I use a, a Magic the Gathering Arena, the app. Uh, if you want, anyone wants to, to get whooped by me, you know, find me on the Discord, challenge me there, and we'll become friends. <laughs> And then Oof, I will wow. dominate. Um, <laughs> I'll get my butt kicked so bad. Uh, so, so, bad. so but, especially but, after a challenge like that, you deserve yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I deserve it. Get but, in there, do it. <laughs> yeah, but I've been playing. Yeah, I've been playing a lot of draft. I, I that's a format I enjoy. I enjoy draft. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Forgotten Realms was on the, uh, the. They were doing normal draft for a couple of weeks, and they just started uh, what's called the quick draft, which is a little bit cheaper draft. Um, it it, uh, it started yesterday, I think, and I've been playing a lot. Um, cool. So here's here's my thoughts so far on the set. Uh, it brings very unique and fun ways to play the game that I think are both um, not overly complicated, but engaging enough that I think it brings a new level to the game. Uh, the the IP use is fantastic. I think there's a lot of things that will really appeal to D and D nerds like us. Uh, in the set, not just like recognizable uh -huh. names, but some of the interesting things that they've done with rolling dice. So uh, they brought in a D20 mechanic. A lot of cards have something. If you play them, you roll a D20, you get some effect, right? Gotcha, um, gotcha. You know, they've brought in ways to manipulate those rules. So things like creatures that have, you know, that ha give you advantage, right? So you can roll 2D20. Okay. Or if you have two of those creatures, wow. you have 3D20 or 4D, right? You know? Um, and then you take the highest or, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. And then the dungeons, the dungeons are, are, are the really fun thing. So you have this ability okay. called venture into the dungeon. Uh, and then you get to pick from three dungeons so far. Uh, if there's more, if they like this dungeon mechanic, I'm sure we'll see more dungeons, but it's uh dungeon of the mad mage, uh, lost minds and tomb of annihilation. So, uh uh, okay. Yeah, the three different ones <laughs> have different like lengths, and you as as you play these venture into the dungeon type cards or have abilities that allow you to venture in dungeon, 
you 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 go down this chart of options, right? So the first one, so like you know, Dungeon of Mad, uh, Mad Mage, you know, the first uh, level is uh, you get one hit point, you gain a hit point just okay. for venturing in the dungeon. Next time you venture, you scry one. So when you scry, you look at the top card of your deck. You can decide to put it back on top or put it on the bottom. You go down another level, and it's like uh, you know a, c- a certain enemy can't attack, or then now you have a choice: you certain enemy can't attack, or you can. Uh, mill the top three cards of your deck and play one of them, right? Or something wow, like that. Wow, okay. Right? Okay. And then it goes down. And, you know, and so the different dungeons are different lengths and you get different abilities. And then there's some cards that have bonus abilities if you've completed a dungeon. So the shortest dungeon is Fandelver. Um, the next shortest is uh, huh. Tomb of Annihilation. But Tomb of Annihilation, you have to you have to be ready for Tomb of Annihilation because you're going to be discarding both people, both players, discarding cards, destroying land, uh, uh, permanents, that type of stuff. So it, okay. the dungeons are really cool. I could keep going on and on. Well, uh, this is I. This is really interesting because it feels like, is it a mini game that both players play? Can I decide I'm not going to dungeon, I'm just going to keep hitting you yep. like I normally do in Magic? Absolutely, okay. yeah. And you, okay. and, you, and you can delve into your own dungeons, right? And you cannot okay. really interact with other people's dungeons unless you have a card that says like, hey... Uh, while this card is out, nobody's exploring any dungeons today. We're just fighting face to face, right? And there's that card. Um, so interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah. So so far, I've I for dungeon running, uh, which which is which is now a style of deck, right? Is a deck to to run through dungeons. I've seen really good success with um, white and black. Uh, both of those have a lot of really good dungeon running options. Um, blue mm. also does. Uh, but blue seems to be the weakest of the set so far I uh, for drafting. Now, this is all talking okay. drafting. I think Constructed uh, Blue has some really cool stuff that I'm looking forward to. Red also has some really cool stuff that I'm looking forward to. If you're doing red, you're probably likely going to be more playing with the dice mechanic. So rolling, 2D, rolling a d20, sense. rolling 2d20. So, so red is a little more focused on that. Uh, and then often, if you were going to dual mana, dual color, you'd go like red blue probably because blue also rolls a lot of dice. Uh, but their dice, sure, ro- okay. and, but they also have the cards that allow you to roll with advantage and stuff like that, right? So that's the kind of combo that I'm seeing a lot in drafts. Uh, and then I'm seeing a lot of life gain with white green and white black. So interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's it's, wild. It's wild that that makes so much sense. <laughs> it's a yeah. It is a really cool set. Um, I will say Magic the Gathering uh, Arena, you can get away without spending any money. Um, I opted to spend no money until this set came out. And then I, you know, I really wanted to get into the set. So I, I spent some money on gems and stuff. Um, gotcha. And it's all just on Forgotten Realms cards. Uh, but yeah, it's it's been a ton of fun. So I've, I've been doing a lot of that. <laughs> Very cool. Um, I, on your advice, went in and started messing around. I got through the tutorial. That's yeah. how far I got. So I think I may start buying some cards, trying it out at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah, let me know. Uh, you know, mm, if you have quests so that good. you need to do, uh, hook, you know, hit me up and we'll uh, we'll play against each other. Oh, very nice. Very yeah. nice. Um, this is so interesting. One of the cards I remember playing with a lot, like in my particular group of friends, was Scheherazade, mm-hmm. um, which is totally banned. It has been forever. Yeah. Um, that's uh, that's the card where when you play it, everybody leaves everything on the table. You pick up your deck and you move to a different table and you start a new game right there. And whoever uh, wins, the, it's, it's meant to be duels, right? So whoever wins the game, uh, awesome. Whoever loses the game, they lose half their life. And then you, uh, anything you played there goes into your discard pile and you go back to the first game. Wow. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I had a good friend who would put four of those in his deck and we, we would play mini game within mini game within mini game. And the games took an hour, right? A two person yeah. game of magic. That's an hour long. Oh, um, wow. And so I was curious when you mentioned dungeons, if that's how it was going to feel like now we have this totally second separate mini game. Are the games going to take a ton longer because of that? But it yeah. doesn't sound like it. No, no, no. It's just, it's, uh, you know, and I know you, I know you missed adventures as well, which came out in an earlier set. Um, yeah. And, and, and it so it kind of plays similarly to those where it's a, you know, it's not necessarily a mini game, but it's a way to advance your cards in an in a gotcha, interesting gotcha. and fun way. So, yeah. And I Sounds think they awesome. did a great job. I, you know, I'm, I, I applaud wizards on their design for this. I didn't think I was going to get this hooked into magic again, but I just, I love yeah. the mechanics and I'm into it. So. amazing and i love the app. Amazing. i love magic the gathering arena it's it's the only way i want to play the game <laughs> okay I mean, that makes sense yeah <laughs> they're doing it right all right well 
Um, was there any more gaming in your in your past week, or should we go ahead and jump into the news? I'm ready. I got news. I mean, I'm going to talk about something in there. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so no worries. Uh, Let's do some news. Yeah, I think I have a little bit more than you uh, when I last looked, so I'll, I'll go and kick... Oh, wait. Yeah, Take I'll away. kick it off anyway. Uh, so, you know, now I want to bring this up because uh, we I, I know of a future guest that we're going to be having on to talk about games of this ilk. Uh, Tokyo Ghoul Bloody Masquerade is now uh, available for pre-order from uh, Japanime Games. Um, it looks it looks really interesting. It's a board game with a bunch of pieces, but it's a social deduction game. Uh, uh, oh. or, sorry, a bluff and deduction style board game. Um, so yeah, so I'm kind of I'm kind of interested how it all how it all plays out. Uh, it's a really in- Tokyo Ghoul is kind of a you know, it's like Naruto meets horror style anime. Mm-hmm. Uh, not Naruto in the way is you follow a character who is your unlikely hero who becomes a hero, right? You know, following that path right. of anime. And um, yeah, it's it takes place in, in Tokyo in the future. And Tokyo <laughs> is divided into different sections. And um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a really cool anime. And I'm I'm kind of excited to check out this game. I love the the first line in the description. In downtown Tokyo, go, ghouls are on the move, and they can only quench quench their thirst with coffee and their bloodthirst with human flesh. Oh yeah, that's okay. Cool. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah there's a big aspect <laughs> of the anime where there's a coffee shop. A lot of them hang out at um, in this one district, and it's, uh-huh. it's 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 pretty cute. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> well, cool. Um. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to jump in real quick with uh, with a game that I've been um, involved with in some time, and I'm excited because it's coming out on Kickstarter very soon. It's a game called Flamecraft. Um, it's by Cardboard Alchemy, and uh, it should be on Kickstarter in on August 10th, which will be fantastic. But it's basically um, about you visiting a town where a lot of dragons basically help out and work at a lot of the shops. Uh, it's got fantastic cute arts of like little dragons baking bread and stuff like that, and making coffee and <laughs> being jewelers, all sorts of things. Um, it's a very, uh, very good like, um, oh, uh, what's, what's the word? I gather ingredients and then deliver these uh, these wonderful boons to the shops, making them more powerful and making the game a lot more interesting as it goes. Um, very cool concept. I like it a lot. And they have hired me to write a bunch of puzzles to go oh. with them. Um, this is a puzzle contest going on. Uh, I've worked with them before. And basically, if you go and complete any of the puzzles, any of the opening six, um, then, uh, then that gets you into uh, the the meta puzzle at the end, the the big final one. As long as you complete any of the puzzles, uh, if you back that game, you get a free miniature that comes with it. Oh, that's cool. Um, one of the dragons, yeah. That's Just awesome. Period. Um, and if you do go all the way and complete the meta puzzle, uh, you get in like set into a raffle to get their entire like super grand Kickstarter prize. So. I love that I'm being part of like the pre-campaign. So yeah, check out the awesome. puzzles if you like puzzles, because those are fun. Um, but it's also a game that I'm pretty excited by, so I can't wait for <laughs> it to come out. We'll be talking about the campaign a little bit more in a few weeks. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, Rich, when you were in high school yeah. and you were a D&D nerd. Uh, uh, a D&D me? What? Or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, you were an enjoyer of D&D. Did, did the bullies call you nerds? <laughs> did they call you geeks? Did they call you dweebs? Did you get uh, bullies? I didn't get bullied. I was in an art school, but you know. Right. I, I remember I got, it was definitely nerd. I got bullied once, but by the end of it, they were confused. So I was just like, what's happening right now? Um, <laughs> and they were like, they were, yeah, I don't know. It was weird. It was so, like everyone had, had watched Revenge of the Nerds and then we moved on. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so you would say, you know, nerds and D&D probably yeah. have, have a lot of things in common. Sure. Uh, including this partnership that Nerds Candy and Dungeons and Dragons have, uh, have gotten into. <laughs> uh, it's a sweet partnership in stores. It's going to be starting in September. Each purchase of a specially marked Nerds Candy unlocks what? one of seven custom D&D adventures. I, so I'm going to have to go buy Nerds just so I can get these adventures and review them. <laughs> there are... If you go to the site dnd.wizards.com slash nerds, you get to see all this stuff, including a ton of downloads for wallpaper. Yeah. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> Those are ridiculous. Just the nerd with a little cloak on and there's a mimic and, uh, yeah. and it says the rogue or the nerd like behind a book with a wizard staff. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what I mean, the heck is this? this as is far great. as like marketing <laughs> partnerships go, like, this seems solid to me. 
I don't know that it's yeah. going to get more people uh, playing D and D, but it will get more people eating nerds. I mean, now it's going to make me think, which, which it is done correctly, right? About nerds like M and M's. You know, the pink ones are the rogues now. Um, the purple ones are the wizards. You could use these to play Lords of Waterdeep now, and then oh, oh <laughs> eat like them that. when you're done. Oh like my that. gosh, that's how that's, ridiculous. That's a good call. I like that a lot. <laughs> wow, I I cannot wait to see what I, I mean. I really loved the uh, the Wendy's RPG, right? Um, for just how intricately the Wendy's world expanded. So I can't wait to see what the world's world of nerds is like. Yeah, I almost <laughs> forgot about the Wendy's one, but yeah, the Wendy's one was real good too. Oh man, I can never forget. Never. <laughs> wow. Um, okay. Well, on that note, then, I have to let you know how excited I am about a game that is coming out, um, going to hit Kickstarter at the end of the year, uh, by Restoration Games, right? Their whole deal is they take old board games that were like, we remember, you know, uh, but didn't have like modern design sensibilities, and they update them and make them fantastic. Um, they did. And the uh, one that they, did they yeah. do Cannonball Run? Is that the same crew? They did Fireball Island. Fireball Island. That's um, what I meant. Fireball Island. That was that was kind of the big one, but they've done other ones. Um, oh shoot, why can't I remember the name? There was one where you are—it's like a, a find Mister X, like find the criminal as they're moving around. Um, and this one had uh, like you're breaking through windows or you're making footsteps. Like there was a not, lot of noises going on. It was kind of cool. Okay, cool. Can't remember what that one was called. But this one, I am so excited. They are—they are remaking Thunder Road. Uh. <laughs> um did you ever, okay, Thunder Road is a game that we found in college at a garage sale. Uh, all the parts, none of the rules. And we spent <laughs> at least one year trying to make up the rules to this game. Um, and eventually, like, you know, we were like, oh, we could just sort of, like, call them and they would send us the rules. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> but it was, the game is ridiculous. It's a racing game, right? So you, you have your cars, um, you're, you're going around, mm -hmm. um, and it's meant to be this you know, futuristic, uh, uh, blah, 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 blah uh, Mad Max style thing, right? Post-apocalyptic, that's the word. And and so one of the things that happens is there's only two road spaces and they're both straight like boards. There's no curves, there's no nothing. Um, when people move and get to the front of board two, you pick up the first board and you shake everything off of it and you put it down in the front. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you are not on to the board when we advance to the next one your cars are gone <laughs> oh wow <laughs> so it's a lot of of running around like uh trying to knock people around doing damage stuff like that um in this ridiculous race where the world keeps ending behind you um in a meta sense oh, that's and it was a ton of fun um so I am very excited for this one. I'm also excited because Dave Chalker is working on oh, this wow. one. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's how I found out about it. And I freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> good designers, good games. Um, and I really, I like what Restoration is doing. Like the new Fireball Island is a solid game. I've uh, I don't know really if you tried it. About it. I know I've yeah. seen the art. <laughs> Art's very good. Um, turns it into a lot of like set building and treasure gathering as you're going through. Uh, but there's a lot of ways to move the fireballs and stay out of the way. Like it's it's more dynamic even than it used to be. Oh, that's awesome. So it's a fun game. Nice. So uh, I'm hopeful for this one. <laughs> uh, you know, I uh, WizKids has always been one of my favorite companies. Uh, the stuff they put out, I've always really enjoyed. Uh, I was a big player of Hero Clicks. Uh, you know, I, yeah. I collect the miniatures now. I I you know, we've had Teos on. He tends to like seem to like the older uh, D and D minis better. I tend to like the newer ones better. I like the more more sleek look, the more you know that type of look. So, uh -huh. um, I'm a big fan of WizKids, and WizKids has started putting out more and more board games. And one of those is uh, a game called a Bequest. And I'm kind of interested. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm interested in this game because of the uh, the the style of game it is it's a it's described as a super genius mix of drafting set collection and i cut you ch uh i cut you choose mechanics perfect excellent um, so the uh, description to players will divide up the assets of the recently departed dr schism a legendary supervillain who has left his estate to whichever of his minions can prove themselves worthy of his lex uh, legacy so yeah, so it, it has a very interesting combination of mechanics, and that I really want to play it. And it looks like a solid game anyway. Um, but yeah, it's WizKids too, so that's that's uh, exciting for me. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Gosh. So it us, was like interesting, interesting, and then you said you or uh, I cut and you choose, and that's one of my favorite mechanics. So now, it's now a, I'm it's, curious. Yeah, it's an interesting <laughs> mechanic, right? Um, so uh, you can pre-order it now, um, and then it will be available for pickup sometime in August. Very so, nice. Yeah. Very nice. Um. Oh my gosh, I just have so much RPG news. Um. Oh no, I'm gonna do a board game. I'm gonna do a game. Are you ready? What? <laughs> uh. Welcome to the last 43 hours of this Kickstarter campaign. I want to mention this because this is ridiculous. Um, the game, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, has a mini game. And that mini game is a dice rolling game. And they have put that dice rolling game up on Kickstarter and made, oh, three quarters of a million dollars. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> on a mini game from the board game. Um, the, the main conceit, conceit excuse me, of the game is you are rolling these dice um, in three rounds each. You are setting them to, uh, let's see, axes versus uh, helmets, I believe, um, to do damage to the other player or block, like it's kind of a mini magic. There's a ranged combat arrows versus shields. Um, Let's see. There is also gathering of power to let you like cast spells as you're playing. Uh, so there are one of the sides of the die lets you steal treasure or that power from the other side. It's a fine game. I've, I've played it, you know, throughout the game. I do it quickly because you're trying to gather all of these spells. You get one every time you play a new Orlog player out there in the game. Um, but I think it's wild that they are turning this into a real, 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 real game. Um, with physical components and everything. And honestly, they look pretty darn good. Like down to, we're gonna ship this game with the little bowls that you know you have to use to roll inside <laughs> in oh, a really cool. annoying way. Cause sometimes the dice like digitally stack on top of each other and you have to like re-roll those. Your little digital hand comes out. <laughs> so wild. silly. Um, I think this is really funny that this exists. I never imagined that it would <laughs> cause it's a mini game. Um, but uh, but they, they're really, really successful. It seems like people like this one enough that they, they do want to get into it. And the Kickstarter, of course, offers all sorts of things, including, you know, huge, ridiculous horns, ridiculous tile or, uh, let's see, linen game mats, uh, lots of stretch goals at this point. So if you're interested, uh, the game, let's see, is going to be about $40 on Kickstarter, coming with uh, acrylic dice sets, these bowls, um, wooden bowls, and a whole bunch of other counters and things to go with it. I don't know. It's wild. It's wild that this exists to me. So I wanted to mention it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, speaking of Assassin's Creed, uh, there was recently a game kickstarted called Assassin's Creed Brotherhood of Venice. Um, and mm. pre-orders are up for now. Now this is created by uh, Triton Noir. Um, part of part of one of the things that are, that's kind of interesting about this is is it, it it's talking about you know in in the news section we don't talk a lot about a actual actual like you know the news side of things we talk more about like the upcoming releases and stuff but this is right. an interesting bit of news um, that they they've released some information on um, they are talking about the increase in shipping prices that their backers are going to need to cover to get their product it's an unfortunate situation. But here's 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 the idea. Um, so uh, the numbers that they came up with to ship things. Uh, so in March of 2019, when you know whenever they opened a pledge manager, it was going to be just under uh, thirty five thousand dollars to to ship everything. Uh, in April of 2021, so you know a little over a year later. Uh, oh no, sorry, almost two years later. Uh, it is now a hundred and five thousand dollars. So that's a, you know, that's a threefold increase right there. June 10th, as of June 10th, they got a new estimate on 2021 of $158,000 US. Now between June 10th and July 8th, uh, it has boosted the estimate for, and I believe this is just shipping US Canada, that's not worldwide, is um, $218,000. Wow. Wow. So, um, you know, and some of those numbers might be a little fuzzy. They've they've released some more announcements mm -hmm. talking about the deals. But, uh, you know, like they're talking about the increase of like, you know, 31 percent here from, you know, shipping around U.S., you know, another 31 yeah. percent for Canada. Uh, you know, the European uh, ones are higher. Britain is even higher because, you know, they decided to leave. Right. So it's just like 
you know, it's 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 this really beautiful game with a bunch of beautiful pieces, but because of the changes from when they kickstarted it to now in freight and shipping and all those mm-hmm. costs, it's just yeah, it's just it's it's going to be real hard to get that game to people. And this is something right. we're going to see not just on kickstarters, we're going to be seeing this across the board with all of our hobby uh hobby stuff because shipping is wild right now. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, I took a look at this Kickstarter uh, just now because uh, I wanted to see what that total was. Right. Um, they hit uh, U.S. probably about a million dollars. And and so that that number goes from a minuscule amount. I, I almost expect that that was way too low. You know, the second number you mentioned about one hundred thousand. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I see that for like a million dollar Kickstarter. But but just being able to foresee how much that would be, that that's going to end up being like one fifth of your entire Kickstarter is now going to shipping when you thought it was going to be this, you know, yeah. very manageable amount is, is not just bad for consumers. I mean, it's terrible, right? Price mm-hmm. of games is just going to go up uh, to, to meet that. But it means that these games that are in the middle of flux have to do this ridiculous dance to get yeah. their projects out at all. And it means that future projects are, I mean, I don't know, not going to happen as often. I'm already seeing people who are not going to be shipping outside of the U S for their games because it's just, you just can't like, it yeah. doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. You know, and in, in, in between 2019 and, you know, now, right. When they kicked lo- uh, initially launched a Kickstarter to today, it's, it's definitely, a, a reasonable amount of time to wait for a game on Kickstarter too, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it it makes sense. Okay, yeah, I'll get it in a you know in two years because they have to finish developing it, they have to finish producing it, right. they have to finish, you know, uh, packaging everything, they have to ship it, you know. So when when prices change that drastically that quick, mm-hmm. how how are the Kickstarters going to adjust? And I think I think the answer is that the consumer is just going to get charged more there afterwards, right? Yep. They're going to say, oh, you're going to have to cover right. shipping afterwards. We don't know what it is. It could be five bajillion dollars. And if you can't cover shipping, uh, sucks to be you. Yeah, I yeah. Guess. Sorry right. you bought this game two years ago. But yeah. <laughs> so anyway, a yeah. little bit of news. You brought up uh, you brought up Assassin's Creed. So I thought I'd, I'd, I'd pump that bit of news in there. <laughs> that's a really good one. I mean, oh my, it's it's a dark thing that we just have to deal with. Yeah. That's why a lot of the Kickstarters I'm back in these days, I'm just getting digital rewards. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm you a know, little, I, little faster. A little <laughs> yeah. faster, yeah. I, uh, I, I like physical products, especially for Kickstarters, but mm-hmm. yeah, I think I'm with you. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. tough. And that's even in the US, you know, it's a good, if I were in Australia. No. <laughs> yeah. oh, um. Well, gosh, should I talk about some more products that are coming? <laughs> let's let's talk more Kickstarter because uh, okay, I, I even have a Kickstarter to talk about. So, oh, um, this one I, I'm actually not sure if this is going to be a Kickstarter or not. Um, so I've been really curious I, because there are a bunch of campaign settings coming out. Right, we've uh, we've seen the rise of of independent. Um, D and D fifth ed producers that are going to do stuff on DMs Guild. They're moving to Kickstarter, but we also have established companies that are really like pushing to make their own um, statements, their own setting, um, rather than making you know variants on the Witchlight coming out or something else. Mm-hmm. Um, and the first of those I want to check out is uh, is by Cubicle Seven. They are putting out the Victoriana for fifth edition. It's going to launch as an OGL project later this year. Um, it is a diverse game world imbued with Victorian, of course, period feel, gothic fantasy magic and steampunk engineering. Um, getting right into that, like 1887, what's going on with the industrial revolution? Let's make it way cooler, uh, and start moving steampunk in that direction. Um, I'm excited for this. I'm instantly excited for this because it, it fills a need where projects like uh, mask of the red death doesn't really hit me. I'm not as excited, Mm -hmm. but I like the advancement to the Victorian age rather than kind of hanging out in, you know, medieval plus, I suppose. So I'm very excited for cubicle seven to be working on this. They've made fantastic projects so far, um, digging back into the fifth ed, um, set or excuse me system that we all have a good handle on and i just want a brand new world so yeah i'm excited for that yeah uh so you know and, and this this kind of piggybacks right on it this kickstarter is from a a new company this is their first kickstarter crowland publishing um mm-hmm. and <laughs> but but the, the 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 they've worked on other games regardless anyway this is this is called wicker punk 
um, in its folk horror. So horror and super, uh, supernatural fiction that reminds, uh, relies on elements of the past, you know, folklore, superstition, and, uh, you know, it, it, in, in the dreadful majest, uh, majesty of nature. So uh, this feels very, to me, very, you know, and, and I don't want to say Salem specifically, but Salem, that t kind of time frame where, mm -hmm. or, you know, it, it, or perfect example, Wicker Man, right? You know, the, 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 the idea of, of that folksy time frame being the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the place that you, you, you play your RPG game sounds really appealing to me you know dealing with, with ichabod crane and the headless horseman right you know that's that time frame i'm thinking um, right and it's a very interesting time frame i think to 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 place a rpg do two things like like that the headless horseman do two things like you know the salem witch trials do two things mm -hmm. that, just that are going all around on that time time frame when you're dealing with things like you know the ugliness of colonialism and expanding into lands that you really shouldn't be going into and the lessons that that land and the Denzians of that land will teach you for crossing the line. So, right. But, uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited about oh. this. I, it, it's, it, it looks interesting to me. I, I, I hadn't thought about doing this setting before, but I, I think it's a fun setting and the art is, is fun. It's, uh, I've, I've been it doing is. it and I'm, you know, I'm definitely pro more than likely going to pick it up via, uh, PDF and, uh, check it mm -hmm. out yeah you mentioned the art and it's got that kind of like um woodblock style right yeah. woodblock prints that i ex associate with that time frame anyway so it, mm -hmm. it does look very cool yeah so. nice. i don't talk about very many kickstarters but this was one that stood out to me so that one hit you yeah awesome all right all right are you ready i'm ready is it time is it it's time fun. i think i have to hit you with the biggest D, D setting news um this year probably yeah um uh, Darrington Press has announced that they are officially uh, bringing back the Taldorai campaign setting from Critical Role. Um, not just reprinting it using 5th edition rules, but uh, uh, calling it, uh, let's see, Taldorai Reborn. Um, okay. Bringing you the definitive source book, the new collection that everyone uh, who loves Critical Role is going to want. Um, Changing the world, updating it for kind of the the most recent campaign, uh, series two, um, and uh, and making this book like two hundred and eighty pages long, just tons of information about the world, uh, giving you actually like stat blocks for the major characters in the campaign, um, different hooks, different subclasses. It should have nine subclasses, five backgrounds, plenty of ridiculous magic items and creatures specific to the world. And, uh, and the team, uh, besides having, you know, uh, Matthew Mercer on board as a uh, lead designer on this one, and also as Hannah Rose and James Hake, who are two fantastic designers as well, worked on a ton of different projects for D&D, &D, um, including um, the Explorer's Guide to Wildemounts and Wild Beyond the Witchlight. So it's, I don't know, this is, this is the book like right here. For me, when I think about where D&D &D could go beyond where Wizards has it, this is the most exciting book for me. Right, nice. it hits a lot of folks that uh, that watch D and D, maybe don't play as much, yeah. and this is like this. I want this. I want this to be the the gentle uh, guide to getting into the system. Um, yeah, yeah. We'll you know, and I, 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 I hope it is that gentle guide instead of a wall of lore that's really like you know, like I the I I would like mm -hmm. this book to be a book that I go and pick up not being a fan or not being a fan only because I don't watch it. Right. Uh, not You're right. any dislike, but not a fan of critical role. I don't know it very well. So, you know, I would like to be able to pick this book up and, and give it to my sister and see if she could get into D and D from it. Right. Uh, yeah. my sister, my sister has a little bit of nerdiness in her, but mm -hmm. she's never played D and D and she, uh, hasn't read a lot of, of the D and D fantasy novels and she doesn't right. know about critical role. Is she going to be able to pick up this campaign? Is it going to be accessible oh, enough? And yeah. is she going to be able to <laughs> right, get into it? Right. Cause that's, that, that's, I, I think that's really important in the fifth edition uh, era is that we are in this era where we are wanting things to be very accessible. We're wanting right. to bring new players into the hobby. And I think if it, if it can't accomplish that, I don't think it accomplishes what it's going for. Um, <laughs> right. Right. And I, 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 I but I think that of any setting book, right. If I pick up a setting book and it's not engaging and doesn't make me want to create stories oh, yeah. in that world, even mm -hmm. as a newbie, like who I don't know anything about the system, I, I, I want it to make me want to play the system. 
right? Yeah, it's got to have that that hook that engages you and brings you in, right? Yeah. And for so many people, it's going to be, it's you know, the world of Critical Role, and that that hook is going to be really, really good, and they're going to start diving in. But yeah, absolutely, I I just like it as a you know an inroad, mm -hmm. and I'm always hopeful to see those. So rather than something like the community builds for itself and it doesn't expand the game. Like this has a lot of potential. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess that's, that's what I'm saying. It's like, I, I want something that really does something, it, not just yeah. a, a setting book for a setting book. Like, you know, we, we right, just right. talked about wicker punk, right? It brings in a setting that I never thought of, 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 you know, an Avenue I've never thought mm -hmm. of creating games in. Um, you know, I, the, the, the critical role setting is just another fantasy setting. Um, so I, I want to know what that hook is. What, what is the hook? Fair is enough. it just critical role? Cause if it is, I don't think that's a good hook, but gotcha, gotcha. if there's something specific and special about that world that hooks people in, I'm in. Cool. Cool. Well, um, I'm excited to find out what that may be. Uh, we'll get a lot more information <laughs> about this game in the future. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. I, you know, I'm in a prattly mood apparently today. Uh, <laughs> that's all right. We got so much to prattle on about. Oh my I, gosh. Uh, so much right. news. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I've been really into the Modifius uh, 2D20 games lately, uh, not to mention we've been playing Dune, which has been fantastic. So I've, I've been di diving into some of their other games, trying to figure out if there is a, a campaign already set for the campaign that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to play, like uh, that I'm building. Oh, sure. Do I want to run a 2D20 campaign? This one looks pretty close. I'm going to check it out. Uh, Homeworld uh, Revelations. So this is a, a new uh, tabletop RPG from Modifius uh, 2D20. Uh, this is a, 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 a reference to the original Home World game, if anyone's familiar with that. Um, but Home Homeland Revelations expands on what we know of the Kushan people, as well as the game's major pa factions like the Kadesh and the Titan. Um, and so, you know, it... it, it it has some of those interesting things and you're looking at the 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 pictures the art is beautiful there mm -hmm. are d6 involved with this one so they're doing that thing again where they're like they're expanding the 2d to 20 system to fit the campaign setting better which which i think is really cool yeah. um but yeah no i'm totally gonna check out this out i'm super excited about it it looks mm -hmm. it looks like it's very much my speed um and uh yeah so this will be something that i'm going to be diving into whenever it's available very cool. I loved talking to uh, uh, Aliza and B because they have experience with the Star Trek game by Modifius, mm -hmm. the 2D20, and how Dune is close, but it's not the same because right. they do adapt the system every time to fit the campaign. And that's just a smart, smart way to do it. Yeah, yeah. And it, we well, we saw that when we reviewed the Fallout game, too. Like, they adapt the system mm -hmm. to Fallout right. to make it fit a little bit better. Yeah, absolutely. They're good. They're good. All right. All right. Um more campaign settings. Are you ready? Magpie Games has recently announced that uh, they are handing out the quick start guide to the Avatar Legends RPG. So for all of my students who play monks, who can cast spells so that they can be the Avatar, this is the game that you wanted to play the whole time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is uh, It is based on Powered by the Apocalypse. Um, and if you get the quick start, it's about 55 pages long. It includes character creation rules, general game rules. It's got a short adventure in it um, and some, some pre-generated characters if you want to play that directly. Um, I love that it is kind of broad. So if you are a fan of Avatar or The Legend of Korra, just you know smash them together and uh, take a look at this book. I mean, a free quick start guide is, uh, is fantastic. And the RPG itself will be coming to Kickstarter on August 3rd. So, you know, just I... over a week. It's it's so weird to me that they made an RPG of that movie. That movie was really bad. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> it. I now I'm curious if. Uh, so I know that they have Avatar World at Disney World. Is that how it works? Universal Studios Disney. I don't know. There is one right in, in Florida somewhere. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's Disney. It's got to be Disney. It's got to be because um, it's every, everything's Disney. Yeah. Right. But I'm now curious if there is an avatar LARP that you play while you were walking through avatar world. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. Yeah. Disney. It's a me, a bondo uh, says the chat <laughs> that, uh, that it is in fact, Disney. Yeah. Um, I, so. I, so all honesty, it's like, I, I, I like, I like uh, avatar last better bender. I haven't watched any legends of Korra. So I'm excited about this. I think it's a really cool setting. I think, there's a lot of cool things to do. There's a lot of stories to tell that aren't the Avatar story. So, right. yeah, I'm into it. Cool, cool. <laughs> um, what else you got? Well, so 
one of my favorite games of all time has always been Shadowrun because I like rolling a lot of dice. Yeah, a, a, yes. you know, you know, Indeed. cups full of dice. Um, how many dice do you think you have rolled all at once? I I, I feel pretty confident. Okay, <laughs> hold on. Twenty. Twenty. Okay, yes. so so in 2019, the mm -hmm. record uh, for the most dice rolled at one time was set. The record? Yeah, the world <laughs> record. The Guinness Book of World Records was set at 6,927 dice. Recently, Wormwood... Uh -huh. Okay. Are, you're, you're familiar with Wormwood, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the people who make... They the, make the, the dice vaults. Yeah, yeah, all, all that really cool stuff. Well, they have decided that uh, they were going to beat that, and they have beaten that soundly. They have okay. rolled. <laughs> let's find. Let's find a number here. What? <laughs> Eighteen thousand dice all at once. I believe it became officially eighteen thousand five hundred and eighty-one. <laughs> wow! So they have earned what? a world record for. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and the part of it was, you know, they, they, they got backers to participate. And so it became okay. a very big communal thing and it's just, it's I just see. wild and it's amazing. And I'm, I, you know, I'm so happy for, for this. It's super great. <laughs> That's incredible. Okay. I, I really want to read up on this story now. Cause I, I was envisioning, yeah, I, I gotta watch the video. I was envisioning like two huge buckets, like yeah. that they were rolling or something all at once. But but this seems a lot more elaborate than that. Yeah, yeah, uh, which is very cool. <laughs> I yeah. like it. I I do not um, think I've rolled much more than twenty dice at once. I I remember I was playing. It was a ranger in Pathfinder One that had like I needed to roll to attack, arrow damage, and then like two d six of uh. I don't know, like holy damage or something. And so I had like five dice sets. I would put them all in a box and just shake the box. <laughs> it was the dumbest thing I've done, but it made things faster because that game takes a year for every turn, <laughs> yeah. especially at that level. Oh, no. oh my gosh. Wow. How cool. That's amazing. Right. Um, Oh gosh, I'm running low on my news, but I still have two things left. Um, I have three I, things left, so... Excellent. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, I do want to take a look at one. Um, oh, it's oh, not no, random. I, no, I, I, I have I no have two things. Left. No good transition. Um, I have one Kickstarter. I, I was taking a look at Kickstarter, and I mean, I, I mentioned it a lot because it's one of my favorite things. Um, but uh, earlier, I took a look at one that I thought was very interesting: uh, the Stargazer's Guide to Aurora. Um, it is by the folks at Ink and Liar. Um, they do um, some some live plays, they got their Twitch thing going and uh, have taken that and added this to this really beautiful Kickstarter page um, as they're looking at this, this product. And the thing that kind of caught my attention specifically is that they have a big deal with the Zodiac. They have their own Zodiac kind of in the game. It kind of creates not only their pantheons, but an alternative method of character creation where you really like dig in, let's get, you know, let's do some horoscope stuff. Let's, let's, uh, let's choose our sign for our character that influences who we are a little bit kind of guides us towards what our character class is going to be and giving us some powers and some drawbacks because of it. Um, I've seen that before, right? That's a thing that people do. It makes sense. It's a cool thing. Um, but they are promising in the campaign setting that goes with this, that that stuff is going to come up all the time, right? That creatures that you see or things in the world are going to be related to the Zodiac. And when you, and the, the object that you see have a relation of some kind, you are the same sign, that's gonna matter. That's actually going to change the, the you? Yes, you, Me? yeah. <laughs> it's gonna change how the game runs. Um, and I wanna see that, that's a promise that I would love to see that feels very, you know, um, uh, I'm trying to remember like Final Fantasy Tactics had a little bit, I think about star signs. And if you attack someone that was your opposite sign, there was a bonus, but it all felt minor and a little bit of extra math and we kind of let it go. I would love to see it like come out flavorfully in an RPG. And this seems like what they're trying to do. That's that's really awesome. I'm I, yeah. I'm going to have to uh, check that out. Huh. The, check that the out. The PDF getting really long. I, it really is. The PDF is $20 uh, at the moment. They have about 150 like five dollar off spots left but right now the campaign's doing really well it's a uh, 200 funded so uh we'll be getting this book in well 
sometime, probably next. <laughs> oh, no, no. Next January. I read that wrong. Oh, that's not too um, bad. Yeah, six months. I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see here. So uh, before we get into my last chunk of news, my last chunk of news is going to take, take a second because it's covering a couple topics. Um, sure. I want to talk about Z-Man Games and Blizzard Entertainment tying uh, their products together. Uh, when you think of Blizzard Entertainment, what game do you think of? I mean, World of Warcraft or, okay. yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's good, that's good. You okay. think Z-Man that's Games, what game do you think of? Uh, Zombicide, right? They don't make Z... Zombicide wasn't Z-Man Games. Well, they both start with Z. So yeah. you asked what I thought, just a little bit well, of letter you were recognition. Wrong. You were wrong. It's Pandemic. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> it's oh, right, Pandemic. Right. Z-Man Games it's, makes Pandemic. It's, it's Come On <laughs> Games that makes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it's Come On Games that makes is on the side. So Z-Man Games makes Pandemic. So so we have Z-Man Games, <laughs> we have World of Warcraft, and they're going to kiss, and they're going okay. to make uh, World of Warcraft Wrath of the Lich King, which is a, uh, it's it's the player's venture into the frozen tundra of the uh, Northern, Northern End. I don't okay. know. Uh, to battle the armies of the Lich King. So this is a pan uses the pandex pandemic system uh, to do a, a a a World of Warcraft style game where the players take on roles of oh. legendary heroes such as uh, Thrall, Varian, Wynn, uh, Sylvanas, Windrunner. Um, yeah, 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 and uh, I don't know, and others to fight against the ever growing undead scourge that progressively populates the game board. So. Um, yeah, it's, and this is just, uh, just the previews out right now, but it's, uh, let's see here. Uh, release date, uh, is TBD. We're going to go with TBD okay. cause I don't see, actually see a date in here. Uh, I don't see it either. Yeah. So TBD, uh, I'm oh, actually November. Oh, November. November. Oh, I missed it. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty interested in this, uh, mostly because I'm not a big world of Warcraft fan. And also, yeah, I, I've not played a lot of Pandemic, but this seems like a very oh, interesting yeah. way to to cram them together. So I'm pretty. I agree. With this. Um, I really like the the idea that it is a bunch of quests leading up to the end. Yeah. Um, I also, uh, it sounds like in this case, you you didn't play Pandemic: Reign of Cthulhu. Uh, no, I own Pandemic: Reign of Cthulhu. But oh, I've really? Still not played it? Yeah. <laughs> That game, uh, I had so much fun playing it. That's one of the only games I've ever played where I have lost the game before I got to take a turn. Um, <laughs> it is difficult. It's got, I mean, Pandemic, we already know, can like just escalate. And that game just, I mean, it was just bad luck. But <laughs> it was tons of fun. I got to play that when it was still like just coming out in what, 2016? Um, at some convention. And it was just tons of fun. And I like it when they take Pandemic and shake it up like that. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, they can make some cool things happen. Yeah, I, I'm pretty excited about it. So. Cool, cool, cool. Right. Well, what's your last bit cool. of news before we my... uh, before I do my last bit and we move on to the next topic? <laughs> well, my last bit of news here is actually a product on DMs Guild right now um, that I'm pretty excited by. It is by one Keith Baker, um, friend of the show, and he'll probably be on pretty soon to talk about a future project as well. Um, but... Uh, he took a look at um, a book that came out recently, right? Uh, Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. And there was a tiny little bit about Eberron in that book. Um, it was about um, a lightning rail that kind of got haunted and went loose and just goes on forever. A very Snowpiercer style vibes to it. Um, and I think it ended up being like half a page or something. I don't, I don't think it's very big. It's just a little note about the ways that, you know, you could make Eberron scary too. And uh, Keith was like, no, 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 no. I'm going to make a, a very large book about this. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have Dread Metrol Into the Mists. And uh, it is a crossover between Eberron and Ravenloft, kind of using the ideas that we get from Van Richten's Guide to create uh, this domain of mourning and war. Oh, and wow. the biggest idea is that this is based in Sire, right? The, the, the realm in the rift, I suppose, the mourning the really bad place in Eberron that just vanished <laughs> in the middle of this ridiculous war. Um, and uh, the idea is that part of it, one of the cities gets lifted away and becomes a dread realm all of its own. So it is a place where the last war of Eberron is still going. There's still the undead hordes from Karnath that are attacking the city of Sire. Um, the folks in Sire are scared about this endless horde. They're alone and they are starting to do some pretty dark things to make sure they win the fight, um, which does involve 
in this case, very specifically, some pretty severe like body augmentation. Oh, wow. So uh, the leader of the Dread Metrol is definitely about like almost a 50% kind of like fantasy style cyborg stuff like that, which is pretty cool. Um, but it seems like a terrifying realm. I mean, yeah. the, the endless war is a, that's scary to me. <laughs> that's real scary. Um, and one of the things that I think brings it out really, really well is one of the subclasses in there. There's only one. It's the, it's for artificers, of course. <laughs> it's called the Master Maker. And basically it is you s turning your arm into this ridiculous battle fist and just constantly buffing it up. Oh, wow. Um, having it so you use you know you attack with your your intelligence you almost have like a an iron man style you know am i going to use you know uh, am i going to tinker with it so it's a ranged weapon am i going to tinker with it so it's you know uh got extra you know can hit someone 10 feet away or something like that uh just getting more and more damage uh and you get these abilities that boost yourself like freedom of movement stone shape things like that so it's it's pretty creepy uh and i i kind of like this idea that as you build the battle fist i mean you have to build more bigger systems so yeah. you know it's not just my arm anymore but it's most of my chest and you know i need some support so maybe my left leg now is going to be like you know a pylon that digs into the ground when i blast this it's just it's great <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> um, it's a very cool book and i like it i think for eberron fans because cool creepy i mean this would be this is how you send your eberron players into the mists right here mm -hmm. um ravenloft fans Holy cow, is it a Dread Realm to like drop into? <laughs> nice. um, and the book is, I believe, uh, about 60 pages of content about Dread Metrol, and then there is a an adventure in the back as well. Uh, through many, many scenes, lots of monsters and things like that. So check it out. I'm, it's I'm, on the DMs Guild. <laughs> I'm ready for our sliders game of uh, Ravenloft. Oh, gosh, I would... Uh, Ravenloft sliders. I'm in. This would be a, a place to end up at for me, I think. This is... <laughs> I feel like a this lot of the places brutal. would be places people end up at. I mean, fair. <laughs> <laughs> that, that game would have a lot of character depth. <laughs> uh, um, I love industry news. I, I, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter what industry. I, I love industry news. I think industry news is interesting. It's fun. It, it gives you good insight into what's going on in the world with, with that particular industry. Um, and so uh, we're going to get into a little bit of industry news now. And I, some of it's kind of interesting to me uh in that it's unexpected right so okay. um so icv2 is a industry magazine type of thing um and they have released the top x games of spring of 2021 so that's january uh through april so for instance this first one is the top 10 card games uh you know uh, that reflects sales in spring um I, I don't know who, what do you think was the top 10, you know, what was the number one, I'm just going to ask you the number one, what was the number one selling game in the last three months or in the so first this, three months this, of the year? This is interesting. Okay. I can't, I, I just opened all these tabs and I'm not going to look at them because I feel like this conversation is about games right now. It's about the, the cult of the new versus the established things, yeah. right? Um, Especially this one, right? Cause, cause it's card and dice games just right. across the board. So, uh, I might immediately think about well, what came out this year, and that's got to be the biggest thing. So, uh, card and dice, maybe a roll and write game because th that's huge right now is roll and write. So mm -hmm. maybe um, maybe the King Domino roll and write. Uh, you know, uh, I, I I would think that would have been a good guess. I would have uh, just guessed straight up King Domino, uh, especially since uh, one of the dominoes won uh, Spiel uh, de Essen this uh, das Essen this year. Um, mm. But number one was Code Names. Really? <laughs> yeah. uh, so here we go. Codenames was number one. Smash Up was number two. Coup was number three. Exploding Kittens was four. Century, which I don't recognize, was number five. Uno was six. Marvel Legendary was seven. Unstable Unicorns was eight. <laughs> Munchkin was nine. And Boss Monster is ten. Uh, I'm wow. impressed to see. So so yeah, right. Codenames, I'm impressed that it's number one. Smash Up is still killing it. And I didn't realize how well it's still doing. And Munchkin's on the board. It's like... Yeah, it, it was it was surprises across the board for me. Um, Unstable unicorns makes sense. It's a newer game. Exploding mm -hmm. kittens makes sense ish. It's I mean at this point it's a five year old game, but it's still a newer game. I was uh, going to ask how many of these games are more than ten years old because there's yeah. I, I think a couple. A couple, yeah. Uh, you <laughs> know, well, I mean Uno, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And Coup. Uh, Coup Smash yeah. Up is pretty old at this point too, right? 
it's probably right around that 10 year. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly. All right. All right. All right. You're, you're doing yeah. pretty, you're doing pretty is, good so far. This is wild. Okay. Because someone, someone posted this great picture recently and it was, it was a picture. I think they were like at an Airbnb or something. And there was a games cabinet that had like sorry and monopoly mm -hmm. and Scrabble. And it was a quick note. Like the caption was most board game libraries in the country look like this. Yeah. And it was just like, Hey designers, <laughs> yeah. focus on this. Uh, it was great. It was super smart. Okay. okay. And now we're talking about board games, right? Board games are a little bit different uh, than card and dice games. Number yeah. one board game of the first quarter of this year. Number one board game first quarter of this year. Oh, wow. Well, now I just don't know. Uh, it's I mean, Is it going to be all the Monopolies linked as just Monopoly? I mean, Monopoly's on that list, right? Top 10? Well, so, so, uh, no, no, no. So these these oh. are more the games you would expect. So this chart is top 10, okay. Okay. Hobby, uh, top 10 board games you know, mm. in, the, in the hobby channel whatever that, that in the hobby okay means. which which i mean the last one was also in the hobby channel so sure okay okay I, monopoly is not on this it's none of the none of these staple games staple okay. family on games were on this list yeah huh well then i'm really not sure uh yeah i don't know i don't All know right. i don't have a guess for this let's, one. Let's, like... let's do this backwards 10 is uh quacks of quellenberg from Ooh. Ooh. games oh that game's so good okay I, i've heard good things <laughs> Uh, nine is Scythe. Uh, okay. Eight is Unmatched, which I don't know that one. I'll have to look that up. Mm -mm. Seven is Azul, which is fantastic. Yep. Six is Root, which is also fantastic. Five wow. is uh, Cubitos from Aldrich Entertainment. I don't know that one. Uh, four is Dune Imperium, uh, which I almost picked up. Oh, it, yeah. it looks so good. Mm -hmm. uh, Wingspan is coming in at three. No surprise there. That uh, would have been a good guess for number one. It would have been. <laughs> Betrayal at House on the Hill is at number two. That's nuts. And oh, number um, one is... Oh? Did you well, they just came out with the, the D&D version for Betrayal, so oh, that yeah, makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, Gloomhaven is number one. Oh, wow. Um, wow, Gloomhaven. Interesting. Because um, they have been selling in... Uh, big box stores, uh, not Gloomhaven itself, the huge box, but uh, yeah. a smaller version of the game, right, um, right. meant to be a little bit lighter. Mm -hmm. So, must be doing quite well. I mean, when I was at the, I was at Target looking at their games collection, and that was like a standout. If I wanted like a serious game, it's that and, yeah, <laughs> very cool. Wow, Gloomhaven. Okay, that's exciting. Right. <laughs> okay, so now we're getting into collectible games, uh, and I promise okay. there's not a lot more. We'll get through this pretty quick. I'm gonna be a lot <laughs> quicker. Ready? Uh, lightning round. Uh, okay. Top collectible game. So this is collectible dice, collectible minis, collectible card. Very top game. Number one collectible game in existence for the first quarter of the year. I, Mike, uh, it's, it's Pokemon or is it Magic? I think it's Pokemon. It's Pokemon. Pokemon's number All one, right. followed by Magic, <laughs> Yu-Gi-Oh, D and D, Icons of the Realms, and then Flesh and Blood. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Same, uh, Dom got it. It's Pokemon. <laughs> Uh, number one, uh, number one collectible game card game, uh, and then uh, uh, yeah, it's it, yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty sweet. So, that makes sense. Uh, now into role playing games. Let's talk role playing games. Um, what's the number two role playing game? Because number one is Dungeons and Dragons. So what's number two? Um, is this is this U.S. or is this worldwide? Uh, this is U.S. Uh, if it was worldwide, I would have said Call of Cthulhu. Mm -hmm. Um, because we all know that's true. Yeah, but if it's just U.S., huh? Um, do I Call of Cthulhu? I'll go with it. All right, because I don't think it's Pathfinder. Uh oh, and we have a vote for Pathfinder. And there, all right, here we go. Number five is Five E compatible. They have grouped all the compatible Five E compatible games right. into one, <laughs> right? Mm. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of those. Uh, Alien is number four. Uh, Pathfinder okay. is number three. Number two is Cyberpunk. So, uh, oh, oh, right. okay. yeah. <laughs> Cyberpunk sold really well at the beginning of the year because of uh, the launch of Cyberpunk 2020, uh, 77. The game, that's right. That makes sense. Yeah. And so that makes total sense to me. Um, I wonder how the game, how, how, how Cyberpunk is. I haven't played it. Uh, I see it whenever I go to, to the store. It looks pretty good. But, uh, but yeah, no, Cyberpunk makes a ton of sense for being the, the, the number two one. So. Absolutely. Wow. That is, that's very interesting. I like seeing kind of where the world is at with these things yeah. uh, at any moment. So nice yeah, no, it's, 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 <laughs> and it's, and it's fun to kind of think about it, right? Everyone, you know, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. hmm, what was the number two? Well, D and D was number one. Right. What was number two? Well, that's kind of an interesting thing to think about because you have to think about, 
yeah, what all was going on in the first quarter of the year and in Cyberpunk 2077 yeah. was a big deal. <laughs> so. Right, right. Wow. Will it be Orlog someday? We'll see. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So speaking of uh, role-playing games and D&D, are we ready to talk about some D&D? I am ready. Um, All right. This, right? This was going to be our big thing. uh, Well, my big thing from last week was taking a look at D&D Live and some of the things that we learned last week. Uh, The art you're seeing is all stuff that uh, we got from Jeremy Crawford, who talked a lot about... um, the wild beyond the witch light. So we'll, we'll chat about that. Um, but, uh, but we learned about three books that are still coming out this year, three books. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, uh, like I said, the wild beyond the witch light. Yeah. Um, we're also going to have Fizzband's treasury of dragons and Strixhaven, uh, the curriculum of chaos, I believe. Yeah. Um, you know, and, 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 uh, Fizzband's is going to be our Dragonomicon. We've seen a lot of, mm-hmm. uh, the dragon, um, uh, subclasses showing up. We've seen various right. dragonborn. Uh, we've seen yep. upgrades to kobolds. Um, and you know, and I, I, I think, I think we're gonna see, we're gonna see a new, new race in this book, aren't we? Like a returning race. Hmm. Hmm. I, 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 I heard, remember. Now. I heard rumor. I, I don't know for sure. I know nothing. I can't remember. But I, I but was I, just looking, and I didn't see it. Yeah. Um, but, but I, but I heard rumor a certain uh, dragon race from. Ah. Uh, yes a certain dragon setting is, is it might be showing up in this book. Oh gosh, that would be fantastic. Um, yeah. So, I mean, since we're talking about it, yeah. What the heck? Uh, I was so excited, like so intrigued when they announced Fizban as the leader for this book. Right. Yeah. Because Fizban is Dragonlance. Right. Um, right. Uh, Dragonlance is what I grew up reading, uh, right. As I was getting into D and D, I mean, there were just all those books in our, our little library. I read, I don't know how many, all of them, say all mm-hmm. of them. All uh, of them. <laughs> so, and eventually I think uh, we ended up playing like a serious Dragonlance campaign in college, but but that was kind of where I started, right? Dragonlance is all about this huge party of what, 11 people um, running around trying to get these um, Dragonlances and control dragons. Mm-hmm. And that hasn't been part of the story in a very, very long time. We didn't see Dragonlance in, in third, fourth or fifth. Um, but uh, Fizban is the avatar of Paladine, the the super good lawful good deity, and I I just couldn't believe it. I was like, or how much Dragonlance is going to be in this book? I don't know. Yeah, I got to read that lawsuit more closely, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, no, I, I you know I'm pr- I'm pretty excited about that book, but um, I'm I gotta say I'm more excited about Strixhaven, except I'm a little so so Strixhaven. There was a lot of issues mm-hmm. with their subclass idea. Um, and so the subclasses aren't getting in there, which is a little disappointing, yeah. but I understand. I agree. Um, mm-hmm. Some of, I like, you know, I thought they were cool. I thought they were cool, right? But they, the, 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 you know, the point that we brought out was the one that was echoed throughout is like, it's much better for some classes than it is others. Yeah. Um, yes. Oh, there's a yes. shout out for Amy Vorpal. Oh, this is so good. Uh, Amy Vorpal. So it like... um. Uh, Xanathar's guide, right? Xanathar uh-huh. has all those quips and comments all over the place. Yeah. Um, Amy Vorpal is the voice of Fizban in this book and wrote oh. all of those. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. That's Absolutely. So, so that is so cool. Oh man. Oh, yeah. So Strixhaven is 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 essentially your college experience in D and D land. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a setting that's very easy to place in most of the settings because most of the settings have some kind of wizard in college. And um, and uh, specifically, if you put it within the Magic the Gathering, you're just another planeswalker, right? You know, that's right. You just walk planes. It's fine. Whatever. Um, but yeah, you could put this in Forgotten Realms. Uh, you could put this in Ever- Eberron very easily, Eberron. Uh, it, it, a lot of the other settings, uh, there's going to be a lot of cool uh, mechanics revolving around being a student. So things like... Right day jobs i'm I, I'm, I'm sure downtime day jobs type of things mm-hmm. um and uh there'll be interesting magic the gathering monsters uh and there is an adventure going from uh one to ten uh which one to 10, nice. well. i believe it's one to ten i'll have to double check that but it looks it, look, it looks like there's adventures in there as well so i'm pretty excited about this that's fantastic yeah the the news of course that uh that we saw this week, I believe, is that it will have at least a prom scene, or at least the ability to go to prom. Yeah, <laughs> strictly yeah. even prom, which just sounds fun. Um, I like that a lot. Well, that's cool. It sounds like you were very dialed into Strixhaven. 
Um, yeah. I spent a lot of time dealing with the witch light. Um, Cause this is for me, this is really exciting. I, I just am really excited about the Feywild. I think it's tons of fun. Um, and as I was learning about it, I realized that I missed something really important. And I don't know when this connection happened. Um, maybe, you know, when did Ravenloft get set in the shadow fell? Because that, I believe, I always thought edition. it was separated. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a fourth edition thing. Shadow fell became uh, expanded and began mm -hmm. to incorporate the dread realms right which is in, very with it, cool within forgotten realms right sure right but it, it suddenly meant that the shadow fell which i just kind of thought like it's got the city of shade and i don't know it's got some creepy stuff you know um <laughs> that was about it became the home for horror mm -hmm. um all within the shadow fell yeah and the flip side to that which i i didn't see kind of explored as much is that the feywild would reflect the same things um and so in the wild beyond the Witchlight, you are going to be going to one of the, instead of uh, the domains of dread, one of the domains of delight, um, which is ruled over in kind of the same way that we just got from Van Richten's guide by this, this major leader who the entire realm reflects who that leader is. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, which is just, I, I had never thought about it that way, but they were like, well, the Feywild is a, you know, well, Maybe it's the other way around. The, the shadow, shadow fell is a dark reflection of the Feywild. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it's just so cool. And I love that it, it is now coming out. Um, this adventure is is pretty exciting. It's starting with this, um, uh, I think we have the map on at the, at the front, this uh, uh, amusement park scene. This carnival, which is supposed to be the reflection of, I believe, a carnival in Ravenloft. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, if you want to make that connection. Yeah. But... Um, you get into this world, you, you deal with this introduction, this, uh, this carnival, and as you go past it, you end up in this realm where, uh, where it's been split up into kind of three pieces, hither, thither, and non, I believe. Um, the maps are incredible. They're like intricate. They're really developed. They show these like oversized features, which are really, really fun. Um, you get to see all these denizens of the realm. Um, but this is like the opposite of, of Ravenloft in a way, because it is um, or uh, the Curse of Strahd, I suppose. It's a joyful place for the most part, but the leader is missing. And that is a thing that we will find out pretty quickly in the adventure is that the the overall, the Strahd of this realm, the happy Strahd right. is gone. And so the realm has fallen into kind of disarray. And these three sections have all become slightly different based on kind of the disarray apparent in them. What if what if the the leader of this realm's name is uh strahd spelled backwards or something that'd be, <laughs> right that'd right be hilarious uh they are also bringing my new favorite race into D, &D uh the heron I, I believe is what they're call, calling them the Her harrigan i i was just i, I mean i forgot what they were folk. calling the rabbit, rabbit. yeah they were call, call <laughs> i don't know like the, oh the harrigan <laughs> Uh, they're calling them Haragons. And so uh, and the reason I, I know this is is, is, is because because <laughs> there is a conspiracy thread already on on, on, on Reddit that these uh -huh. uh, Haragon are not necessarily good, uh, that they are demons like the demagogue. Ooh. And, yeah, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, that's very exciting. <laughs> yeah, OK. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's this rumor that they're the evil. They're evil demons or something. Yeah, I love that. Absolutely straight. Uzagi Yojimbo confirmed. Oh man, I am <laughs> I am very yeah. into this. I was very into this. Usagi Yojimbo. I'm very mm -hmm. into this. Uh, I I I uh, you know when they when they let us uh, play test the, the the rabbit folk they were calling them then I enjoyed it. I thought it was ridiculous. I was ready to play. Oh one. yeah. And I am so <laughs> I'm so happy that there's like this subtle thread going through Reddit where it's like they might be demons. <laughs> um i totally have i on my D, D beyond like character list i have sir hops a lot on there oh, yeah. sometimes my students see that and they're like what's going on right there yeah what are you talking about don't worry about it it's, <laughs> it's gonna it's, be fine it's nanya it's a demon prince that's all it's a demon uh, <laughs> prince <laughs> oh my gosh um the other thing that i'm really excited about with uh with this is that uh, the wizards is doing something specific that they've never done before there is a pathway through this campaign designed as part of it where you don't fight at all you can oh. succeed without combat all the way through and i have no idea what that looks like that's wild 
Uh, Great. I, I do say I want an owlbear chariot uh, as as the mm-hmm. pictures are, are slowly populating. I'm like, yeah. oh, well, hello. That sounds like yeah. fun. I believe that <laughs> is exactly what my uh, rabbit folk uh, whatever will be riding in. <laughs> oh, yes. Rabbit folk <laughs> warlock. Right. Um, all these pictures uh, are from a, a video that um, uh, Chris Perkins did along with other folks talking about the witch light, uh, James Wyatt, um, and they were helpfully screenshotted by someone on EN World. So thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> I love this picture right here with these, these, this looked like a hall of mirrors, but no, they're all like hanging marionettes. Uh, <laughs> beautiful. Like giving us. Um, I thought this was supposed to be a less creepy uh, zone. Well, I mean, it's it's a uh, these would probably be brighter and more active if the leader of the zone was here, but now they're in disarray. Oh, <laughs> um, so I think is... I think that's going to be the theme: is that things are 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 feeling the neglect of not having a leader. I don't know if new people are are rising up or whatever that need to be um, dealt with. Um, but there are quite a few I- incredible NPCs. Um, there is a, the potential to meet a displacer beast kitten. Um, <laughs> that has been confirmed. Um, uh, let's see, what else do we have? And there is custard damage in the game. Um, <laughs> uh, and also the, the carnival itself has a lot of really interesting NPCs in it that, uh, that you can definitely chat with. Uh, it looks like some of the classic characters from the D and D animated series may be on here. Um, there is a roller coaster in the map that is, uh, apparently, and I haven't done the research, uh, identical to the one from the animated series. That's so good. So it is uh, possible that those people went into the Witchlight carnival, uh, and that's what led them into the world of D and D because this is meant to be a, uh, an entryway into the Feywild. That's so good. I, I I'm super yeah. excited about that. That's going to be fun. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So uh, at this point, I think, uh, are we ready to get into our, our, our review segment? Did we get all, think so. all your notes on, on the D&D Live announcements? Definitely. I mean, it was it was fantastic. There's yeah. stuff to go back. And if you are fans of these things, if you can, uh, I, I want to point out real quickly, um, there was one game in particular, and it was, it was B. Dave Walters, who was running for, I believe, the cast of AP Bio. And first of all, it's incredible because Patton Oswalt couldn't be there for some reason. And so is just a screen. Um, and is, it, it looks like the floating heads of the, the Hall of Presidents in Futurama or something. Um, it is just this screen set up in a chair and it's got like uh, a cloth hanging behind it. So it looks like <laughs> that has some like depth. Oh, and wow. it's really amazing. Um, but more importantly, that, that is, there are folks there who kind of know what they're doing. I think a few of them have experience, a few don't. Um, and B. Dave Walters is doing the best job of teaching people how to play D&D. It's so, oh gosh, I wanted nice. to... I wanted to like walk over and and shake his hand because there were just little bits, you know, like yeah. when you're running a game and you you don't want to tell someone like it's just pick up the D10. It's just it's that one. Right. So you want to be really helpful and, and yeah. say things like, you know, most of the things we do in this game, we roll a D20 and add a bonus. So whenever I say roll a die, usually we're talking about a D20 and it was all just so positive and it really like got them in there. So, I'll have to check that out. I uh, it was nice. I watched a little bit of the Jack Black one. And uh, I think I watched enough of it. Um, yeah, yeah. I didn't. Sh- I didn't see that one because that I knew that was going to be a whole lot of chaos, and I was yeah. there to like try to pick apart the news for the books coming up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it and it was and it was. And I I don't know if if anyone else watched it and enjoyed it. I I don't know. I'm not cute. I I don't watch a lot of live play. Uh, the only ones mm-hmm. I kind of watch are, are are here on the saving throw. Um, but uh, right. yeah, so I, I I don't know. I couldn't get into it. I don't know if people enjoyed it, but it was a little too chaotic for me. Uh, but I did watch some of the new segments and that was pretty fantastic. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a good thing. I, I thought overall for a, for an online thing, I mean, this is this is G4's first time doing D&D Live. Um, yes, that's a good, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we had some fantastic, I mean, it, it's cool to see like uh, saving throw folks like up there on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Very cool, um, but uh, but overall, I thought it was a pretty well done thing for for being entirely put together, like you know, in their own studio. Felt very professionally done. Um, but I kind of missed the old ones where it was like the crowd getting in there, and I knew there's you know, they're part of D and D Live is entertaining this this whole group of people who are there to watch the experience. So yeah, uh, we'll see what happens next year. Yeah, I'm excited. All, All right. right, here we go. 
Let's talk about these reviews. And there's two <laughs> in one. Whoa. Uh, How do we do that? <laughs> all right. So uh, what we're going to do is we are going to discuss uh, two different products that do very similar things. Um, one of them, you know, let's, let's, let's get this little bit, these little bit of details out of the way first. One of them is in fact in beta. Uh, mm -hmm. so like all the bells and whistles that you're expecting aren't going to be there. One of them is a very established product. One of them has done something very unique and, uh, awesome. That's gotten it a lot of attention and the other one may have copied it. Right. So, so, <laughs> so, so there's. Right. I mean, you know, there's there's information yeah. like I did a lot of research and, and there's a bunch of threads um, talking about Legend Keeper versus World Anvil. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Um, and Legend Keeper created some really cool design things that that Rich will talk about a little bit. And mm -hmm. shortly after it came out, World Anvil's version came out. Oh, I see. I see. So, yeah. yeah so I, I, I don't know where I sit on that, but. You know, that's that's the way it is. It seems like natural for this type of product. But anyway, without further ado, Rich, tell me about your experience with Legend Keeper. Yeah, so uh, so I went in and I uh, attempted to investigate Legend Keeper a little bit. It is uh, based on a Patreon uh, that you can find at patreon.com slash Legend Keeper is the only way to get access to the Legend Keeper product at this point because it is in beta. Um, and what it is, is a place to basically write all the campaign notes for your campaign and hand them out to other folks so they can see what's going on. It is it is a fantastic version of a wiki, um, writing all your information down. And the big deal is that it is set around a map. And if you're taking a look at the, the image here, this is one of the maps that you can get. Um, say that you were investigating this place and you really wanted to think about a visual feel for your campaign world. Your players could be looking at this and you could drop pins all over it. And if they click on those pins, boom, they get a, a ton of information that you have kind of preloaded in about those locations. It is in many ways a piece of, I mean, that's what video games do, right? I go check the mini map. I look around, I get to highlight the fields. Oh yeah, this was the place we did this thing over here. Thank you very much for dropping that link in the chat. Um, it's a very like positive experience because it feels like how I think about games these days, right? We're playing Destiny 2. Where's the thing I'm looking for? I just pop up the, the world map, I get the director, I start looking around until I find the destination I need. This gives me that information and more, right? It can mm -hmm. be, this pin gives me this NPC, there's here, this is a quick description, here's a picture, stuff like that. Uh, and I see it in this visual form. I can still go back and, and look at it like a wiki instead and just see all my pages if I want to. But it is this page that gives it a lot of power. Um, so I thought that was fantastic. I started looking through. I was able to, in about 20 minutes today, um, upload a map of Arrakis for Dune, um, set a pin for the setting of our Imperial landing site uh, and the survey mission to put another pin where the grief might be and, uh, and put up some basic descriptions and upload some pictures. Um, and that was kind of nice to do. Uh, beyond that, not a lot of functionality. I'm not running a campaign out of this. It is just a knowledge base. Um, and whether they're looking for that functionality later, not exactly sure. Um, but for me, this felt like a lot better than using a, a site like Notion mm -hmm. as a campaign focused information network. Notion, I feel, would be really good if I'm trying to keep track of like what my DM is telling me, you know, when I'm writing these things for my own personal stuff. But but this is like a world first um, way to look at that information. Yeah. Um, so uh, I didn't take a lot of pictures, mostly because every time I tried to take a screenshot, all the pins would vanish, <laughs> uh, which was depressing. Um, and also there's, there's not a lot of ways to see what other people are doing with the site. Uh, I, I didn't see a lot of projects. I'll hopefully be digging into the discord to find more because it was, it was kind of neat. And I would love to use this along with say roll 20, you know, mm -hmm. if we're talking about things to add to our games, when we get back to physical space, this is such a nice way to keep the world organized that I like a lot. Yeah. And it's um, currently what five bucks a month is the minimum pledge. So five bucks a month. That's, that's mm -hmm. not too bad at all. No, um, and if you check the the Patreon, there are pretty regular development updates, um, information about the build and technical stuff. Um, there are some additional maps, and those maps have been added in, so you could you could start working with like a free one to kind of see what's going on. For example, the one on the screen. <laughs> um, it seems like a good deal, and I kind of like what's going on. It doesn't. There's not too many options. It's really really focused. This is what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a map. It's pins. It's uh, wiki pages. Um, all yeah. in a very like classy 
simple scheme. So uh, you don't get lost. <laughs> it's really nice. Yeah. Uh, All right. Well, ready to hear about getting lost in World Anvil? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do it. <laughs> All right, so uh, where um, Legend Keeper sounds pretty feature light, uh, mm -hmm. World Anvil is very feature heavy. Um, okay. So we'll, let's start out by talking about who this this is for. Uh, there are different tiers of which you can subscribe. Uh, there is the free tier, which is basic. That's what I was playing with. I do think I'm going to subscribe and use this platform for my future campaign, just so you see where, where I am with this particular product. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's 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 different layer levels and I'm gonna talk about this first because this is a barrier of entry, right? So Freeman, you get basic features. So, you know, not a whole lot, but you get uh, like, you get uh, two different worlds slash universes you can make, make. You can have 20 drafted articles, 175 articles. Uh, you get a, a lot of the things, um, but you don't get private worlds or articles. So that means all your okay. stuff is there to see. You don't get secrets. You don't get secret notes. You don't get, uh, you have ads. Um, there's theme, it, you know, there's a lot of stuff, right? You get for, for it, right? Uh, and you have 100 megabytes of uploads. So this is going to be important later. Okay. The first tier is Journeyman, which gets you one gigabyte of uploads and a bunch of other stuff. And that's $40 for 12 months. Uh, the next tier up is fifty-eight dollars. Uh, it, that's for twelve months, and then one hundred and five dollars. So, journeyman, that's probably going to be like me and you, Rich. We okay. will go in, we'll build our world. It's not going to be super robust, but it's going to be robust enough for us to play a game at home. Uh, the okay. next step up is master. So, this is for serious storytellers and world builders. This is you're you're going to get a lot uh, a lot of more bells and whistles. Um, including things like the ability to produce uh, manuscripts, interactive tables, uh, a diplomatic relations web, which looks cool, family Whoa. trees, uh, you know, a marker groups on the map features. We'll talk about map features here in a bit. Um, you know, it, it, all kinds of cool stuff like that, right? And that's actually yeah. probably the level I may end up signing up at because I like some of that stuff and I'm, I'm building a complete new world from scratch. I'm not borrowing um well i'm borrowing but not in the same way uh and then the, sure, of course sure. of course of course the the last one is the grand master worldsmith so this is for seasoned creators and perfectionists this is 105 dollars for 12 <laughs> months still not not unreasonable right you know if, yeah. if this is really helpful for you you get five gigabytes of uploads um pretty much you know then everything is unlocked in addition <laughs> so this is where the change is uh you are going to get um uh, some advanced management, uh, early access to to different world communities, uh, custom okay. article templates, which is cool, uh, custom categories, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just all kinds of statistics and no ads for visitors or co-authors and just all kinds of cool stuff, right? Lots of stuff. Wow. Whereas one was very, one of these, Legend Keeper was very, you know, focused. This is very robust. Uh, yeah. has a lot of tools when you come Sounds in. Like it. Yeah. And, and, and uh, this is where I'll start using some of the, uh, some of the screenshots I took. When you come in, you can uh, set up your system. You can set up uh, what system it is, what your world is called, the name of it. You can create a cover image, um, all these things. Cause the idea here is instead of the map being the focus, the wiki build is the focus and it's supposed to be a very easy, accessible way to maneuver. Um, another thing you can set up is accessibility and usability features as okay. well as 18 plus content, right? If you're running that kind of adventure, there it is. It's available to you. Um, so some of the things, cool tools, uh, there's a studio for you to create random generators. So we all know these, we the, the random tables, right? There's a way for you to create these and, and create, uh, really cool things just, just with these tools. Uh, nice. then there's also the manuscripts. And so both of these are at that grandmaster level. That's the hundred dollar plus a year. Uh, so if this is something interesting to you, you pay a little bit extra. It's a cool tool. Uh, could you do this all in Google docs? Yes. Could you do it in a free version of notion? 100%. Would you want to? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, and so just so you have an idea of what the tables look like, these are the tables that you can kind of generate and you can roll right in there and they're interactive. Um, and you can uh, search them. They're interlinked through all kinds of, uh, you can put them in articles and stuff like that. It's really huh. pretty cool. That's okay. not bad. 
Yeah, and so then I was talking a little bit about article templates. Uh, so this is once again a grandmaster. The reason I I I, I highlighted this is because article templates are going to become uh, more. We'll, we'll talk about this stuff here in a little bit, uh, which is where the article templates are going to come in. Now the primer is our main main hub. This is the main area in which the players are going to view the campaign. So on the right hand side, you see. Uh, that there are some articles. These are articles like I was just talking about. You can create article templates where you fill out certain spots, produces the article for you. Okay. Um, you know, and these are just the introductory ones. So, you know, like how to organize your campaigns, how to stage, you know, et cetera. But you see one that says, well, welcome to R271. Well, that's my campaign. Um, and so that's what your articles show up like that. And then you have the ability to hide them to whatever from your players. Cool. Now, these right. are how you develop the articles. So each one of these uh, little icons um, are, uh, it, it, or sorry, are, these are specifically for stat blocks. I apologize. But they you have similar icons for articles as well, where you click it, has form for you to fill out, and uh, then it generates the article for your players to look at. Same thing with stat blocks. You can generate stat blocks based on the system that you picked. So D&D 5e, so it uses the SRD rules. You can create those. Uh, you have the ability to create historical entries, secrets, create a timeline, wow. and the map. All right. Here we go. So <laughs> it has a to-do list. <laughs> uh, some of these oh are... Oh, my gosh. Right, right. Some of these are your to-dos, your to right? You know, uh, but they could be also to-dos that were, you know, seeded based on x y and z uh i didn't dive too much into this but it, it is it is a way to help you get through right you know so legend keeper sure, sure. not much there anvil a lot there everything uh, yeah right <laughs> so um here's kind of an idea like this isn't this isn't specific but when i say there's forms for you to fill whenever you click an article it kind of looks like this uh what this is specifically is creating the time frame in which your campaign exists uh this is important whenever you set up things for your timeline you're going to set up a timeline for your universe like this is zero zero ar because that's when gotcha. uh, we all uh -huh. moved into augmented reality right you know and, and, and you create these timelines um here's where the article is clearly my slides got mixed up in order but you click on these you click into them and then it's all filed under the wiki system within these different categories Okay. Right. And it has mouse overs, which are nice. So, you know, for example, whenever I was clicking on the geography ones, you could talk about worlds, universes, galaxies, solar system, planet, you know, so on and so forth. So it's easy to navigate. Wow. Here is uh, what the staging area is. You can use, um, you know, uh, very light HTML as well as markup uh, in here for your articles. This is kind of the beginning of a timeline. So what you can see is you can see there's, you know, at 4,000, the soul system was evacuated. At year one, the Artusa system was established, right? So this is a celestial, or this is a celestial event, and this is a disaster destruction, right? And sure. so they have different symbols too to kind of keep track of it. When you click these, you go into an article that talks all about that. All right, so it has stuff so that you can prepare stuff for your campaign, including plot points and preparing for your sessions. Uh, here is some notes for you to take during sessions. This is, uh, yeah, essentially that's what it is. It's wow. it's campaign notes. <sighs> Has calendars. Would you like to make your own custom calendar and weather patterns? Uh, what kind of information would you like to write about each geographical location? What location it's within? Uh, the ruler, uh, own, owner's rank, the organizations, organi alternate names for this place. And then lastly, as we all know, this is the tool that Legend Maker focuses on. Uh, right. This in World Anvil is an add-on that's just part of it. So I can drop these pins, and those pins can either link to an article, uh, or they can link to any of those categories that we looked at before, right? It can link to any of, okay. any one of these, right? Uh, but specifically, it's 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 a location is is tend to be like a location article or another location. So currently, the way I have it set is if you click on the sun next to uh, or this 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 next to there, it'll say soul system, and it'll say dead underneath it, and then you click it, and then it takes you to the soul system, right? And then you know you highlight over Earth, and it has a pin there it says Earth. You click that pin, it then takes you to an article about Earth, or it takes you to a map of Earth. I haven't decided yet wow. which. Okay. Right. So this is really, really, 
robust. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, seems like it. Holy right? cow! Yeah, so much. I mean, so <laughs> yeah, right. this is this that site is for exactly you doing exactly what you're doing. Right, yeah. it's building up. You want to know everything about your campaign world. Mm -hmm. You want it to be accessible and obvious and have all the connections that you really want in a dynamic campaign world. Yeah, um, Legend Keeper at the moment. I could use it as a DM, but honestly, it feels like a player tool in a lot of ways. Like mm -hmm. you're on Dune, I upload a map because I'm a player and uh, being attacked uh, by a kitty. Um, and uh, and as you are kind of uh, going around the world, you could drop the pins as a player and just write what happened here or yeah. who you met or things like that, right? Um, that functionality feels really good. I don't think I need World Anvil for that as a player, right? That's a very oh, DM tool. Yeah. Um, but Legend Keeper's got kind of both. I think I could I could play either play it as a DM mm -hmm. where I have this campaign all set up, um, and uh, and want to use my map to kind of show what's going on, or just for note keeping. Like I, I kind of like it. I've set up notions for campaigns before, and because it's all text, I kind of lose part of it. But but maps. Oh, I love maps. Right. Uh, so I kind of want to use that interface a lot. That might be what I what I end up doing as a player. Yeah, no, yeah. that's that's super valid. I didn't even think about that as a player. I I love that idea. Um, you know, playing in a you know as a journal for your character, playing in the Forgotten Realms, you could easily set up the map of the Forgotten Realms or wherever. Right. Put map mm -hmm. points where certain adventures are, and that's how you keep track of notes. Right. That's yeah. a fantastic. I love that idea. Yeah, even I'm, if it's like I would not yeah, do that oh. in World Anvil because it's complicated, but that would be hard. Legend, Legend Keeper, Keeper sounds pretty 20 minutes or yeah. less, you know, you can be doing that. Um, it was very quick when I signed up for the Patreon. They sent me a link uh, within minutes, so I right. get in there pretty fast. Um, now I'm just thinking about it. I kind of like the idea that I, I send players a not fully developed map you know mm -hmm. I, I would you know in if it was ravenloft i wouldn't you know give them the exact map of the area but what if yeah. i had a you know yeah a nice friendly one that i pick up in Valachia somewhere and <laughs> yeah i you know yeah it, it, it could be something really cool too where like you're in a mega dungeon and mm -hmm. and people mark things on there yeah no that's... right things that they remember stuff to come back to because you can share legend keeper with other players so it's a cool uh yeah hmm. yeah nice. Yeah, two different tools for two very different uses. It feels right? like, well, two, yeah, and two two very similar tools at that, right? Because yeah. both of those tools, like on the, if you were to to try to Google one of them, the other one would easily come up. So, right. uh, yeah, so so with that in mind, um, audience, like uh, you know, leave. So everyone who's on YouTube watching this later, make sure to like and subscribe, but also leave a comment. Yes. Let us know uh, let, let us know what you think about uh, World Anvil, Legend Keeper, or if there's a, a third option you think we should check out. And uh, and we'll totally check it out because I'm always looking for new tools. Uh, Absolutely. But while we're chatting about that, uh, f folks, everybody, make sure and go and check out our, um, our YouTube channel. Uh, it is uh, youtube.com slash saving throw show. Go there, check it out. Uh, and uh, like, subscribe, do the little bell thing that the YouTubers are always talking about. And uh, make sure and join the society. Come and, and join the society. Be a part of the Saving Throw uh, community. Join the Discord. Uh, just just come hang out with us. Um, I, I have been uh, challenging folks to Magic the Gathering games. Uh, probably well, unwisely, but you can find me on the Discord and, uh, and, and get your uh, wins in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I keep forgetting that if you, you know, take a look at our Patreon right now, we have a series of one page adventures and I wrote the last one. So oh, nice. check it out. <laughs> um, it's all called right. frozen food. <laughs> all right, Rich. Well, uh, the way we wrap up this, uh, this every episode is uh, what, where can the folks find you this week? Well, this week you can find me definitely on Tuesday, uh, right here on Saving Throw uh, with the Dune rpg um so i'm very excited for that uh, other than that find me on twitter at armalina um we'll be launching the academy of adventures after school program uh admissions are going to start opening um on august 1st so that's kind of the big stuff i've got in mind unfortunately um i don't know maybe i'll post some pictures of marzipan just so uh you can also find her sometime this week since she's joined <laughs> us here on the show um, what about you? Uh, yeah, so I think I'm finally through all my technical difficulties with all my 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 setup and stuff. So I will be 
uh, well, of course, I'll be here Tuesday for Dune, uh, but then I should be DJing on my channel at least a couple times this week. Um, I am going out of town, so there will be no soup next weekend, but I'm going to L.A. Yeah. to visit one Mr. Mr. Richard Molina Weber, and we will probably play test a few games, so that should be yeah, a fun time. Right. We won't see you next week. <laughs> Uh, but in the meantime, make sure you stick around and watch New Pantheon a Academia coming up next, right here on the <laughs> Saving Throw channel. Um, I think that's it. I think we did it. We did, it. We, we did, did it. it. we did do it. We did do it. Put that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yep. Just uh, set that soup to simmer. Is that what we're up to? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> simmer that soup and... Uh, don't use your air fryer. That's not going to work for this. All right. Right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Have fun, everyone. See you all next time. <laughs>